tuned in to the Community Cats Podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats Podcast. I'm your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we are speaking with Susanna Della Medellina. Susanna joined the Central Oklahoma Humane Society in January of 2014 as president and CEO. Prior to that, as vice president and executive director of PetSmart Charities for 10 years, she grew the organization from $8 million in annual revenue to more than $45 million and led PetSmart Charities to become a sector thought leader and the largest funder of animal welfare in the country. Prior to PetSmart Charities, Susanna spent more than 20 years in the for-profit sector in executive-level marketing and advertising positions. She was Vice President of Marketing for Northern Trust Bank of Arizona, Vice President and Management Supervisor for DDB, Needham, and Daly and Associates in Los Angeles, and Account Supervisor for J. Walter Thompson in Chicago, Illinois. During that time, she developed award-winning marketing and advertising campaigns for Kellogg Cereal Company, S.C. Johnson & Sons, Save Safeway and Vaughn's Grocery Stores, and Kaufman and Broad Home Builders. Susanna started the Arizona chapter of the wellness community and also Friends of Animal Care and Control, the fundraising auxiliary for Maricopa County Animal Care and Control. She has received various awards for leadership and volunteerism, including the Wellness Community Hope Award, Han Kachina Award, and AAWL Animal Champion Award. Susanna graduated from the University of Iowa with a BA in Business and Spanish Literature and received her MBA from the Thunderbird School of Global Management. She is a pet parent to four dogs, Scooter, Loretta, Emma, and Hank, and three horses, Cash, Envy, and Shelby. Welcome to the show, Susanna. Thank you. Happy to be here. So I was just wondering if you might share with us specifically, how did you get started on your path with uh, animal welfare and caring about cats? And you also have quite a few dogs and, and horses. That's true. Well, you know, I am, I think, like many in our field, a lifelong animal lover. And I started my career in the corporate world, in the for-profit world, but always had a desire to, at some point, um, transition into something that would help with animals. And so I was very fortunate to be able to run uh, PetSmart Charities for 10 years. And then I had always been very, very interested in um, having done the funder side in uh, also having some experience on the grantee side. And it's been very interesting because it's given me two very different perspectives on our world. Can you expand on that a little bit? Sure. I think that, you know, when you're a funder, you're looking at strategy from a national standpoint. You have experts on your team who know the animal welfare welfare issues very well. But, you know, each community is different. And when you're on the ground actually doing the work, sometimes I think you some of the requirements that come from the national funders may not be quite right on from your perspective or you'd like to see, you know, different types of opportunities. One thing that's common in the uh, funder world is not to fund staff positions. So when you're writing a grant for a new program, but you're not allowed to ask for staff support, that makes it really difficult because as a, an organization that has to you know, pay for the operations and pay for that staff person, it can be difficult you know, to raise the funding to do that for a program that would really make a difference in your community. So you have learned what it's like being on both sides. I've also worn that hat a bit too, and I think it's made me stronger on both sides, actually, in terms of understanding the perspectives from the donor side, the desire to measure impacts and to also measure in units, but yet as you say, there's so much supportive stuff that goes on within an organization in order to be able to support a program from happening that you have to appreciate the needs to fund that support. Exactly. And you know, I think from the funder side, you get to see the impact reports and you see the results of your funding. It's a very different experience actually being in the community and making the decisions that result in impact and then being kind of able to celebrate that because you're actually seeing the faces of the dogs and cats that, you know, you're saving. And that's a pretty cool thing. So it's it's very fun for me to have gotten to do both sides. So now when you're 
at the Central Oklahoma Humane Society, you are in concept more hands-on than you were before. Wearing your president and CEO hat, what are your key initiatives at Central Oklahoma Humane Society? Well, we are very lucky to have been in the ASPCA partnership market. So we're a relatively young organization. Um, it will be nine years old at the end of this year. But we have accomplished a lot in that nine years in terms of the services that we offer the community. We have a very robust adoption program. We have a high volume, high quality spay neuter program that provides services for the community as well as our own adoptable pets. We have our own in-house medical clinic. We we also just started a relocation program and we will transfer out 1,500 dogs this year to four partners in other states where they can be found homes, and then also started a bottle baby program. We work very closely with our city animal shelter. We actually have a formal agreement with them, and to help reduce the number of dogs and cats that are being euthanized there, we're always looking for creative solutions and creative ways to continue to move that needle. And just the addition of the bottle baby program and the relocation program has jumped the live release rate really significantly. We had, uh, for the first quarter of this year, the highest live release rate ever at 81%. We were pretty excited about that. And I can attribute it almost directly, primarily to the relocation program. Wow. So that 1,500 is represented in that statistical change? It is. Oklahoma City is really interesting because, um, you know, in the middle of the country, a fairly mild climate and a population of 610,000 people. And so we last year, our city animal shelter took in almost 24,000 dogs and cats, which is a really big number for a community of our size. And, um, you know, Oklahoma has a lot of people issues, which I think translate into then animal problems, as well as just, you know, a very temperate climate that's conducive to longer breeding cycles. And so um, it's, it's really exciting, you know, when we can introduce programs. We have beautiful adult dogs here and a lot of puppies that are very desirable in other communities. And our partners at our animal welfare partners at the uh, city shelter, you know, they try their hardest, but they're under resourced and they have a huge volume of dogs and cats entering the shelter every day. So we're happy to be able to help with some of those programs and help, you know, carry that load. And how long has your high volume clinic been around? We opened the clinic in, let's see, 2008. And last year we completed almost 14,000 spay and neuters of which about 3,000 were our adoption pets and the rest of them were community animals. That's a fantastic number. I would think you would start seeing some other dramatic changes in numbers as a result of all that spay neuter going on. We have. We've seen uh, intake uh, decline very steadily and gradually at the city shelter. When we started working with them nine years ago, they were taking in 30,000 dogs and cats and had a live release rate of 25%. As of last year, at the end of last year, intake had gone down to under 24,000 and live release rate was at just a little under 70% for the year. So we know that spay neuter is contributing to that. And, you know, we have a very uh, robust TNR program. We have a community cat program. We have a barn buddies program. And so we're really trying to um, provide service or support all of the animals in our community, um, not just, you know, the adoptable pets. That's great. It sounds like you've got the full community cat as well as animal welfare toolkit going on there. And you had mentioned that the ASPCA had supported the city through one of their projects. Is that correct? Yeah, the ASPCA has a program, their uh, their partnership market program, where they will select a, a market and then come in with resources over a three to five year period. And, um, and then you graduate as a community. And the goal is to, you know, help bring together partnerships within the community, uh, set a live release rate goal that you can all work for. Our, our goal was 75%. And then just, you know, provide coaching and mentoring. And then as a, an alumni market, I guess I could say, you know, there is some level of continuing resources available. Um, but it was great for us because I think it jump started us. It enabled us to really introduce a lot of programs very quickly and also, you know, caught the eye of other national funders. When I 
was at PetSmart Charities, uh, we actually did some pretty significant funding in Oklahoma City um, because of the A's involvement and also the caliber of OK Humane and its relationship with the city shelter. And now let's take a moment to listen to a few words from our sponsors. Flashlight tag was fun when you were a kid, but no one wants to play hide and seek with their trap. Find your trap's location quickly and safely, even when you visit it at night, with the Reveal Wild application for Samsung Galaxy, HTC One, Sony, Xperia, and other Android phones. Or go to tinyurl.com forward slash Reveal Wild. Are there any other shelters or other organizations in Oklahoma that have sort of the same partnership relationship, or is this unique just to your organization? We're actually unique in Oklahoma. And another kind of interesting element of Oklahoma is that in up in Tulsa, there are a couple of sheltered organizations in addition to the animal welfare organization. But in Oklahoma City, the our, our city shelter is the only organization with a shelter. All of us are primarily foster based. We do have a what I call an adoption storefront and our um, cats go into communal cat rooms and will live there until they're adopted. Adopted, but our dogs are brought in every day by our foster families and then picked up at night if they haven't been adopted. Our typical you know, length of uh, time in the adoption center is usually two to three days for a small to medium dog and maybe a little bit, you know, four or five days for a large dog. But we have amazing fosters and volunteers who really enable us to have a big impact in the community. How big is your shelter? How, what's the capacity that you can actually hold in your physical space. Um, we actually, the cat, uh, we have eight cat rooms, and can, so that would probably be any up to 35 or 40 cats that are before full. Um, we do have kitten spaces, you know, where we can have kittens additionally. And then we have 14 what we call dog suites for the dogs to be in during the day um, when they are brought in by their fosters, a couple of meet and greet rooms. So we're not really that big in terms of a ton of animals at our location. But what's nice is that we have high awareness in the community. We have regular foot traffic. And this year we're on track to do probably around 3,300 adoptions. And we'll actually have to pull a little over over 4,000 dogs and cats into our program so that we constantly have them in the pipeline, you know, to achieve that 3,300 adoption goal. That's amazing that with such a small space that you're able to adopt out so many, I would assume you probably have quite a few adoptions that are actually direct from foster care too, so that the cats and dogs don't even make it into the shelters. We do. And, you know, we're constantly working with members of the community who've requested something specific to try to see if we can match up to the best of our ability. And also, I think that, you know, we have such an interesting model. It's very different from other groups and other communities. We actually have five locations. And I always laughingly say that we have all the pieces of a shelter, but not in one place. We have an intake facility on the grounds of our city shelter where the animals start. We also, uh, that's where our relocation dogs stay until they're boarded to go, you know, to the other shelters. And so we we walk across this, uh, the parking lot to the city shelter many times a day to pull dogs and cats. They start there. They then um, are placed in foster. We have the in-house medical clinic that supports our foster families and dogs and cats with anything they need. Then they're scheduled for surgery and they go to our spay neuter clinic for surgery and ultimately to our adoption center for adoption. And then we have a little administrative office as well. So I think a lot of times people are amazed that we can do as much as we do with five different locations, but it is it is a well-oiled machine and it, it runs amazingly smoothly. Strategically, many organizations sit down and they strategically try and think of things and they think of, well, do we need to build, you know, big, large infrastructure and coming from your sense of leadership and the thought of running a big capital campaign, it sounds like you feel pretty convinced that even with a little bit of space here and there being sort of spread around, it's still, you're still very powerful as a group. 
Yeah, I think it's possible to have impact without having, you know, a really big sheltered, a uh, shelter capacity. Now for us, I mean, the question really then becomes, can you do more? And at what point are, have you kind of maxed out your model? And I think we're probably there, we, we, you know, in terms of recruiting foster homes and being able to do that. So we do have plans in the future to actually build a facility and centralize some of the services only because it will enable us to do more. We'll place more pets. We'll be able to offer some more wellness services out of our in-house clinic. You know, we'll be able to do more for the community more efficiently. But I would say that said, you know, I really do want to emphasize that you can have a big impact without having, you know, a honk and huge shelter. And it takes a lot of time and effort and strain on an organization to raise funds for a big shelter. Mm -hmm. It does. It's expensive. And then the maintenance, you know, is very expensive as well. How does an organization make a decision to do an expansion plan? Um, Or how would a board make that decision along with the lead, you know, U.S. president? Uh, You know, we look at the data. I mean, we have a community view. Our city shelter takes in the majority of animals in the community, and we actually evaluate data on a quarterly basis to see what's happening and then year over year to see what kind of progress we're making. You know, and our goal is to be able to get to a point where we're placing all the placeable animals. And so, you know, we look at what we're, we'll be talking about actually this year with our strategic plan uh, meeting is really, you know, where are we now? And if we really want to get the community up to a consistent 85 or 90 percent live release rate, what do we need to do? And that means that we just need to have more capacity to do more. And I would assume that your board of directors would be uh, needing to get on board with that. Absolutely. And that'll be, you know, discussion at the strategic planning meeting. We'll get in depth in terms of, you know, that particular topic and then what we're going to have to do to achieve it as far as a capital campaign, as far as expanding our income so that we're ready for the increased expense when we ultimately build something and open our doors. So that I have a wonderful staff and board. I have to say I am my team is just amazing. I mean, in terms of their passion and their excitement and willingness to learn. And I have a very engaged, very involved, very wonderful board. So I'm very fortunate to have that. It can be a challenge sometimes if you're lacking one or both, you know, if you're trying to make progress. Well, it's good to have if you are embarking on a growth stage too, is to have support on both sides. That's tremendous. Absolutely. And my team has been really amazing because, you know, we have grown very quickly and in some ways we're still kind of in an infant stage. Um, But, you know, for me, coming from my background, I always say that um, we are all incredibly passionate about our mission and we want to achieve our goals of saving lives. But we also have to have a business approach to it because we are in the business of saving lives. And so if we're not looking at the financials and our budgets and holding ourselves accountable for achieving those financial goals. And we're not going to be able to do as much as we'd like to do to save the animals. And so I've been really fortunate in that my team is always eager to learn and anything they haven't known how to do, they've just jumped on board, you know, and said, teach me. That's that's great. And things that you learned, you learned a lot, it sounds like, or your staff learned a lot from the ASPCA program when it was done. Do you feel that other than this potential expansion, there's more components that are needed to help community cats? Yeah, I think, you know, we are always looking for more ways in which we can save cats. We, Oklahoma is a little unique again in that, you know, from my putting on my PetSmart Charities hat, around the country, mostly you see more dogs than cats, I'm sorry, more cats than dogs entering shelters at a, you know, 60-40 ratio usually. And Oklahoma is exactly the opposite. We see more dogs actually enter the shelter than cats do, which would indicate that we have a lot of cats living on the street who never make it to the shelter. And so we think that 
any programs that we can put in place to kind of humanely manage that population of free roaming cats is really important if we're going to really try to do our best for all of the animals in the community. So right now, we, as I mentioned before, we have a community cat program, we have a TNR program, we also have a barn buddy program, which is really popular here in Oklahoma because we have a lot of folks that live on large acreages and they have, you know, they want mousers in their barn or something. And so it's a really great environment for a cat who's not going to do well, you know, in some other type of environment. So if there are people interested in finding out more about the Central Oklahoma Humane Society or reaching out to your staff to find out more, is there a way that people can find you? Yeah, and they can go to our website, um, www.okhumane.org, or if they want to send us an email, they can just send an email to info at okhumane.org, and they'll be redirected to the appropriate person to answer their questions. And in closing, um, is there anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners today? Not really. I mean, I think that just uh, one of my kind of real learnings in being in this field and coming from my background is that, you know, it is possible to make a difference. It is important to look at the community overall and not just your organization, because if, you know, if we're really going to achieve what we need to achieve in our communities, we have to be looking beyond our own operations to, you know, how we're helping the animals in the community. Sue, that's great. Thank you so much for agreeing to be a guest on the show today, and I hope we'll be able to have you on in the future. I hope so, too. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Community Cats podcast. If you could go to iTunes and review the show, we'd really appreciate it. When you do, take a screenshot of your review, go to communitycatspodcast.com forward slash review and enter your information and we'll send you a t-shirt. While you're there, don't forget to check out all the ways you can support the content you're passionate about. Thanks, everyone.